Hey everybody, this is Jason at the Alliance Project. We've got Joseph Reyna here, and you guys requested him back, so we're going to have him back on the show. He's got a few things to talk about. How you doing, Joe? Pretty good so far. I'm doing pretty good myself. Just had a long day at work today. Finally got in touch with you there. We've been yapping back and forth and hard to meet up, so finally get to meet up with you. But uh, we have your book, Incredulous, and we're going to put a link there below, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that because a lot of the fans and viewers have been asking more about it and wanting to hear more about it and wanting to hear more from you. So go ahead and uh, just show us what you got here for this evening. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me back on your show. Um, there were a couple of things I wanted to to start out with, first off, this uh, contact thing I had, I, I thought it was interesting, it never happened before, but I, I do know that Earth should have already gone through several cataclysmic events, and they seem to be um, assisting us in thwarting them, and there's a lot of evidence for this, but the most unique evidence I've come across is Comet Ison. Ison was supposed to be 13 times brighter than the moon. I could not find it with my telescope, and I just bought a really nice telescope. It was around my birthday, and it wasn't there. There's some stuff I was looking up on my phone. One of them was, um, it names this one particular astronomer saying that Iceland seems to have been stopped for 133 days, and they can't explain that. The Russians were also mentioning that they were, it was changing positions. It was uh, altering its course, and comets shouldn't really be doing that. Also, they mentioned there were objects moving around it. What's really fascinating is Comet Sighting Spring, which came a year later, roughly. It, uh, it went back past Mars, and NASA did not report on it, and the EGA didn't report on it. But there's a video out there. I probably should copy it before it gets wiped out. It's on YouTube called Huge, well, it says Huge Explosion Spotted on Mars After Comet Sighting Spring Passes. And I'm not talking about just a blast like Jupiter did. This was uh, the entire planet lighting up. And the aurora, about three times the size of the planet. And after it went by, there was weather patterns. There was clouds. The, the poles started melting. It's almost like terraforming a planet. Apparently, all you have to do is send a comet right next to it. And then it, it intensifies with the electrical discharge of the planet's magnetic field and its atmosphere. And Mars is supposed to have a very weak magnetic field and a very thin atmosphere. So Comet Ison, which would have been much closer to us, I mean, we've got a fairly good um, thick atmosphere, and they've been spraying aluminum in it for highly flammable once you get it electrified. Um, our atmosphere should have ignited with Comet Ison going by, and that's that would be the least of our concerns. I believe they actually disassembled Comet Ison because it was supposed to be 16 times brighter than the moon. And right now, Jupiter and Saturn have far more uh, satellites surrounding them than they used to. So that's just one small example of the assistance we're getting from off-world. And I want to bring that up before um, we started this because I don't expect the, um, the destruction they're talking about. It should be there. It, all the evidence points to it. But we are so unique in the universe that they're trying to preserve us because some of them, when they transition, would like to be born as humans. And the reason for that is because we've been disconnected from Creator. And in a perfect world where we don't have the type of governments we do, that would be quite a unique experience for someone to um, experience their own, I guess, sense of individuality which they don't really get to do. And in experiencing your own sense of individuality, when you transition, you leave here and you stand before creator or in the presence of creator, not to be judged, I'm just saying in the presence of creator or in the presence of anything else, you maintain your unique awareness and that's, that's unknown in the galaxy. You, everybody melds into everyone else. And I, I don't know if I'm ready to be completely telepathic walk into the room and everybody knows everything about me I'd rather there were some things that were kept secret 
but that's supposedly what what they do. Anyway, that's something Creator has been trying to have their masters do since the beginning of time, I guess. And uh, most of their masters have never even come close to that. So we're more godlike, I guess, in a way than they are. And that's why a lot of these destructions aren't happening. If we, as a, a collective, pray for the Ebola virus to be gone, all of a sudden it's gone. I wonder what would happen if we prayed for a particular individual to become ill and get out of the way. I'm sure it would work, but it wouldn't be in a positive direction. And that always comes back to you. Yeah. I, I completely agree with the, the book. Thing. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, someone asked me, why did I write it? I started writing it for myself, for my own um, information. Because a long time ago, someone shared with me, and she was a historian, that Jesus had an identical twin brother. And that kind of shocked me. And then I just kind of kept my, I guess, my mind open to that possibility because we went over a lot a lot of information concerning this. and I all the evidence started fitting and falling into place the story of Judas Iscariot the way he betrays Christ why he betrays Christ how he gets over there and weasels his way in 30 pieces of silver all that sort of stuff it doesn't really make any sense when you start looking at at the actual evidence that they have and that's why Luke when he finally his third version of the events and he starts writing about Judas, he doesn't see the motive. He doesn't find it. So he goes with the old Twinkie defense, which is the devil made him do it. And then you have John. And John is unlike any of the other Gospels. In this Gospel, Jesus is more of a divine individual, a divine being like Hercules. And he has nothing good to say about Judas at all. It's really bad. But I actually found some of the more, most supporting evidence for the identical twin brother of Jesus being Judas in that gospel. And um, that's more in the second book. The first book, if you really want to know a lot about Christ, who he was, what he came to do, and what the political situation was like there, that would be in the first book. And I don't drag it all out forever. It's just in small sections where I take the last week. And the last week wasn't even an entire week it was only like four days so from sunday to wednesday was the entire week from the time he entered israel to the time he was executed on a wednesday and that threw me off that he was executed on a wednesday but all the evidence shows that that's exactly when it happened he would have been dead for 72 hours and that was very important that they were dead for 72 hours that's why he had to wait for um lazarus to be i guess already deteriorating before he showed up. And um, anyway, just all the evidence just points to to it being more along the lines of what I saw. And by saw, I mean I was shown visions and I was given memories. And then I had to go find the evidence to prove that these things were real. Some of it was in the Gospels. Others were in, in other books of history. But when I found them, it, it was so amazing. There's um, a book out there by, it was written for, or this little boy is five years old, so he can't write the book, but his parents wrote it about his, his experience. And they made a movie of it called, called Heaven is Real, or Heaven is for Real, I think it's called. This little boy had an appendectomy, and he, um, he said he had died, although they didn't recognize that he had died. Yes. And his father's uh, there listening to him, he was a pastor. And the little boy is just playing there, and he says, you know, you know, Jesus has a cousin, and he baptized him, and they're, they look a lot alike. So the father's like wondering why, why he's coming up with this, where did he hear this? Then he described um, a little sister of his, and he goes, what do you mean, sister? Oh, she was, she was before me, she's a little older, and she hugged me and said she was my sister. He goes, what's her name? He goes, oh, you guys didn't name her. And it was a stillborn baby. So she never received a name. And then he uh, identifies his grandfather. He gives us the name of his grandfather, the nickname Opa. And he had never seen his grandfather. And, but he couldn't recognize. He said, is this, is this him? It was an older picture of him with glasses. He said, no. But when he saw a picture of him being young, the boy said yes. 
Now, what I found fascinating about that story is he starts talking about a horse, that Jesus has a horse, and it's a rainbow horse, and he got to pet it. And I think a child of that age would see a, a unicorn as a horse. But my research showed it would have had to have been a unicorn. The unicorns, according to the Keys of Solomon, were allowed to run on earth for a time because they were hunted for their pelts. These animals were said to be, um, they, just, they were described as horses. They had a single horn on their forehead and there's their pelts, although white, shimmered like a rainbow. So they were hunted for their pelts and then they were hung along the um, tabernacle when it was in the desert. And then after that, the animal was removed from earth. And that gives the exact description of this, this unicorn except for the horn. And I've always wondered if I could talk to that little boy, well, I'm sure he's a little older now, he would actually describe it as a unicorn. Or maybe did describe it as a unicorn and the family wanted to leave that out of there. Yeah. Um, in the 22nd Psalm, which I quote from in the book, it mentions the lion and the unicorn. So the word is in there. The, apparently it comes from there. And I, I argued about that with myself and Holy Spirit. Went, really, I think we should leave that out. We're trying to win Christians over. And he goes, this is what it was. Okay, I'll put it in there. So that was a lot of what I did. Put stuff in there like that. Um, I discovered that the temple, when it was destroyed, the Romans were, they were broke, just like the U.S. is broke. And they had to invade Kuwait, get the oil out of there. I didn't watch the debates. I heard something about it. Did Trump go into that? He goes, how do you go into another country and take their oil? Because you just, you know, bring in soldiers around the area and start pumping it out. Well, that's kind of what the Romans did. And I discovered that in the Roman legions, when they attacked, uh, Jesus said there would be the abomination of desolation. I hope I got that right. Yeah. He said, Rome, when you see the city surrounded by armies, flee to the mountains. And there's a lot of people that preach about this happening now or happening in the new future. But according to all the information I uncovered, it already happened. It happened back when I destroyed the temple. That was the third destruction of the temple, not the second. And it's really important to understand that. Because if the temple is ever rebuilt, the uh, Israelites will go back to sacrificing. They are not going to turn to um, Christ as a Messiah or accept him as Messiah. The temple was built over a, a valley that had been filled in. There were massive vaults down in there. And there were passageways, secret passageways that where the rocks actually moved out of the way and people could walk through and then the rocks moved back in the way. And uh, that's why they came and dismantled it all because they had to get to the silver and the gold that was in there to finance Rome. When they attacked Israel, Israel had no standing army and they didn't go and just attack Jerusalem. They systematically went throughout Judea, destroying every single village they came to, completely obliterating it. And at that point they had Jerusalem surrounded. There were people trying to get into Jerusalem to provide uh, supplies, food, or whatever. And I don't, I don't know why they kept trying to do it, because they were being crucified. Uh, um, he built a mound all the way around the city, and on that mound, he would crucify the people. And every day, there were new people being crucified. That didn't seem to stop them. He thought he'd wait them out. He wasn't able to wait them out. And this was um, Vespasian. Then Vespasian was called uh, to Rome. The, the guy called Flavius Josephus. He was a commander of one of the, I guess, units that sort of band together to try and fight the Romans. And he, they were captured. They were all going to die. They were not captured. They were surrounded. And so apparently what he does is he starts saying, hey, let's, uh, let's draw lots here. And that way we don't murder each other. We'll, we'll kill. You know, whoever gets the lot, they die. And they die. And the last guy, he commits suicide. It's going to be one of us committing suicide. Well, apparently he worked it out where everybody died except him. And he did not commit suicide. He wouldn't turn himself in, but he convinced Vespasian that he was a, a soothsayer, someone with special cap uh, powers, and he said that Vespasian would be emperor of Rome. So Vespasian kind of hung on to him for a little while. Then Vespasian was ordered back to Rome. He became emperor, and uh, that's where we get all the histories of uh, Josephus from what he saw when they conquered Israel. When Titus, Titus, the son of Vespasian, was then ordered to take out Israel, and this is really important, yeah, because Rome expended a tremendous amount of force to destroy Israel. And the only evidence I could find for that was that on the day Jesus died, the moon had to have left orbit, stood in front of the sun, which was the uh, day of celebration.
celebration for Sol Invictus, the sun god of Rome, and uh, then came back. And historians wrote about that. Those years are missing from the Roman records, year 31 and 32. So when Titus is fighting, he's got more than half of the Roman legions with him. He had 13 legions plus engineers. I think there are only 25 legions altogether. So he's got half of the army of Rome to destroy Israel. And he can't do it. He finally breached the walls and they, they actually repelled him, fought him back. He still couldn't get through. And when he finally did get through, they ended up uh, crucifying everyone in the city. And they were crucified into the walls. They, there were not enough trees or sticks, uh, wood to, to crucify everybody. And Josephus says they sort of contorted the bodies in all kinds of directions to be able to nail them to the walls. So when he entered uh, Israel, I mean, he, he took Israel, he took the slaves, the temple priests who were trained in the art of masonry who helped build the temple, he kept them as slaves. They were used to build the Colosseum in Rome. And so when he entered Rome, they built the tribute, the Ark of Titus. And it's not very well... When you go there, you have to look for the Ark of Titus. Or it's not easy to find. It shows the menorah that's in there, and it shows the um, the Israelites being brought in. It doesn't show the Ark of the Covenant. But that particular privilege was only given to commanders who were fighting against insurmountable odds. Yeah. And there's no way he could have been fighting insurmountable odds unless they feared the God of Rome. I mean the God of Rome, the God of the Jews. And when he entered into the temple before he destroyed this um, killed the pigs and put their blood on it and had sex with some whores on the temple. He mentioned that someone who vanquishes a king out in the desert is great, but someone who vanquishes a king in his own palace is even greater. Uh, that was not a palace, it was a temple, and the Jews had no king, so he had to have been referring to Christ. And anyway, everything just pointed to the fact that something big happened when Christ died and why these people especially the pagans were were becoming Christians because they all understood they all had these savior cult understandings and we knew nothing about the savior cults I knew nothing about them 10 years ago that they ever existed in the savior cults these men were all there's over there's about 15 of them but they were all born of virgin mothers they were all demigods they had uh, been born in a cave on the winter solstice on Christmas. They had disciples. Some of them had 12. They performed miracles. They raised the dead from uh, back to life. They turned water to wine. They um, healed the, the blind, the deaf, the lame. And uh, then they all were betrayed, crucified, and resurrected. The interesting thing is that betrayal is not the word used in the Gospels, any of them. Judas did not betray Jesus. The word is handed over, and uh, Paul uses the same word. He also doesn't seem to be, he doesn't seem to know that Jesus was betrayed in any of his writings. And what I found really fascinating was um, Paul says that Jesus first appeared to James, then appeared to the 12. That would mean Judas would have been among them. He appeared to 500 and finally to himself. And when you're counting the disciples, when Jesus makes his first appearance, there's only 10 mentioned. And the reason would be because uh, Judas has hung himself and uh, Thomas is not there. He doesn't show up for eight days. Judas was Thomas. His nickname was Thomas because he was a twin. He would have been gone during that time because he was at Jesus' side during the entire ordeal. And he would have touched the dead body. And having been a, a priest of the Sanhedrin, in touching the body, he was defiled and had to go through a, a ritual cleansing that lasted seven days in, in this particular location called the mikvah. It was like a, a special bath. And you just stayed there all seven days until you were cleansed again. So he shows up on the eighth day. And, um, and of course, that's when Thomas is said to have found Jesus. And there were other things that amazed me. I didn't make all these discoveries on my own. There was a Hal Lindsey came up with a really interesting one. He was giving us a, a talk, and I've never found this on the internet. I've searched for it, searched for it. It was only in that one talk that he gave. I had it on, on audio, and I don't even remember how he got my hands on it. But he was describing the tomb. He was saying, why, that when Peter got to the tomb, what did he see? 
that made him believe because up to that point Peter wasn't sure that Jesus had resurrected and so he um he apparently saw a cocoon shaped shell of Jesus when they wrapped him in these uh, gauze bandages and they put a lot of myrrh it becomes like shellac like making a piñata in school and so they just bound everything and it takes a while to bound, bind all the fingers bind everything but they don't bind the face they just surround the neck area and then they place the um it's called the tali, a prayer cloth. They're going to place that on your face, but before they do that, they have to cover your face, and then they place a tali over that. And there's coins over his eyes. That was not a custom. And the coins date to that, that particular time when in the, the Shroud of Turin it shows two particular coins, and they were minted at that time by Pilate. When, um, when Jesus resurrected, just like he went through the wall, walked through material, he would have gone, stepped out of this cocoon-like thing. So Peter gets here. He sees this hard, shellac, solid casing with a tiny little hole at the neck. And Jesus was not a little guy. So he would not have been able to crawl out of there. His fingers were wrapped, his feet. There's no way he can get out of there. So that, that right there showed to Peter something extraordinary, extraordinary had happened. The tomb was not opened for Christ to get out since he could walk through the walls. That's what the light body is about. Um, it was moved by the angels so that you could look in the tomb because anybody who opened that tomb was going to be crucified by Rome. So all these things were uh, really fascinating. There were two other contemporaries of Jesus that also did miracles. And to this day, their tombs are venerated. People go there and place flowers. They're very clean. They're painted all the time in Jerusalem. And Jesus' tomb has been forgotten. No one knows where that one is because there was no body in there. And what I came to find out was that, um, okay, so, so what does all this mean? What does this have to do with us that Jesus did this? Is he a God? Uh, he said we were the sons of God. It has to do with, I believe, a shockwave coming to earth. In the, um, in the snow, there's a record of shockwaves that have struck the planet about every 26,000 years. There was a small one about 13,000 years ago. I don't think that was a shockwave. I think it was the destruction we talked about. And I saw a picture of uh, Saturn with Earth next to it. It's just really tiny. Uh, everything we see on Earth as land would have to have been just one little island. And it was a very small piece that came out and became a, a sphere. And then, of course, Pangaea would have broken out, which is why the Atlantic and the Pacific are the same age. Also, there's only 12,000 years of erosion on the planet. And when this shockwave, well, we would have had very little atmosphere. So some of the cosmic debris would have gotten onto the snow and recorded that we have cosmic debris on the snow. And that's how they know these shockwaves hit. There's too much cosmic debris in the snow. Now at 26,000 years, it seems that our, our galaxy, the galaxy we're part of, which we're not really originally part of, is the Milky Way. Way. In the center of the Milky Way is an energy source that ignites and becomes a quasar galaxy and fires a um, shockwave in all directions. And we're just beginning to get hit with a bile shock of that. And I really believe that when that shockwave strikes the planet, you need to be standing on the surface and that shockwave needs to hit your skin. That light will instantly, instantly transmute you, transform you, or metamorphose you into a light body. That's what um, DNA does. The light rewrites it. And apparently time doesn't matter in this particular uh, place in space where we are in the photon belt. It'll just happen instantaneously. So uh, that's where they say that, you know, some will be standing there and one will be taken, one will be left, I, I believe. And the, um, the transformation will be instantaneous. You just won't see the earth that we understand anymore. And I've been talking to Brooks Agnew. He has followed a tremendous amount of the older, uh, the writings of ancient cultures. The book he wrote, The Ark of Millions of Years, had to do with that. And he believes that there will be a shifting, kind of like the spirit, energy spirit of Gaia will separate from the heavier matter. And that's kind of what happens to humans, I guess, when you become this light body. And it'll be a, 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 an interesting trick not to be afraid. Because when I was little, I grew up in a haunted house, and something just had to go bump in the night for all my sensors to activate and just freeze me up, and I'd be terrified. I'd feel that, that thing that they say is just in your imagination, where something like kind of walks up to the door, 
and your body just locks up. You can feel this presence there. And you want to turn around, but your body's like, no, you're not going to turn around. And it just freezes in fear. Some of the, um, when I was reading the book of Tarzan, when the leopards give their growl or roar before they attack, that freezes uh, monkeys, you know, they just stay in place, but Tarzan would run and jump in the water and that saved him. So it's, it's just a predatory response. You just freeze and you have to overcome that. And I remember when I was doing exorcisms, I, I was laying in a, a bed in California. It was a really nice day and I just felt really good and had some time on my hands. And I said, okay, I think I'm ready. Um, I summoned forth a demon. And when I said that, the door started just vibrating so fast, like it was going to come off its hinges. And I went, okay, okay, I don't think I'm ready because my body just started locking up. Uh, my heart started pounding really fast. Adrenaline kicked in really fast. And today, right now, I can actually encounter a being like that. And I will not lock up. And I will not be afraid, literally not be afraid of it at all because it has no power over me if I don't give it any power. And we almost have to reach that state, and I don't think humanity is ready for it. That's why I asked for the um, meteor to get through if they could, because we, we really need disclosure. They need to get down here, and they need to start working with the individuals that are ready to work with them so that you can um, start realizing who and, and what you are. Because if we don't have that, that particular uh, help, then people will just lose their minds. I've um, read accounts of individuals who were saved. They were, uh, there was, a, sto there was a, a problem. The ship went down and it sank. There were only a few survivors. And these men were pulled out of the water, but they were terrified and they just died within minutes. They were out of the water. They had thick wool coats on. They're very wealthy. And they just dropped dead. And it was a, an individual I discovered who had someone known who was a friend of the family had cancer. And I know of several cures, several um, different things they could take and be completely healed of it. Before I could see this guy, he had six months to live. I had found out about this on Friday. Before I could talk to him on Monday, he had died just from fear. So humans, uh, our, our emotions have been so ramped up in order to control us that we can die from fear. We can also die from a heartache. Uh, other beings don't have that, that problem. Anyway, that was some of the, the things I wanted to get out there, why we're so different and unique. And um, we're not just unique because of that. Gaia is unique. The world that we live on is unique. And she's about to wake up. And it's going to be a totally different type of planet, unlike anything that's been seen before. Way, way more life on this planet than is on entire solar systems out there. And she has a brand new species on her. And um, somehow all this is... Um, I don't know. They they see it as the most spectacular thing, and they want to spread this type of stuff all over the galaxy. Um, that's that's pretty much where my research has taken me. That information, most of it's in the second book. The um, in the first book, I get into a lot of um, the Ark of the Covenant, and someone asked me uh, on another show, "What were the stones for on the Ark of the Covenant? What were they used for?" And the stones, there's two stones that were uh, used to activate the covenant. They'd kind of be like the launch codes. One stone is carved from a, they think it's from a meteorite that was rhodium. And another one that was iridium. The rhodium one is a, it's cylindrical in shape, about as, as thick as a, a thick crayon. And I don't think it's more than about two or three inches long, possibly three inches. The second one, is a stone of uh, perfection. That one looks like a curly Q fry. That's the way it was uh, cut. And if you ever do research on the very first lasers they invented, that's exactly what it looks like. The rod in the center is activated by the photons and um, by the light being shot through the, the lamp that's coiled around it. And the electrons inside can go basically back and forth, back and forth. And they don't escape from the sides. They can only escape from the flat surface on one of the ends of it. And when they escape out that surface, they're all cohesive. They're all the exact same frequency, so they hold together. And that's the kind of light that's hitting us. The, the light from the center of the galaxy is a synchrotronic light. The Ark of the Covenant, when you charged it up by lightning or, or static interference, especially on a volcanic hill or mountain, 
the wings, where they came together, right between the wings, there'd be an arc, a very bright light just sort of suspended in the air. There was something called the mercy seat, now set in the center, and it just, just reached that location. You would take these two stones, place them on top of there, and then the lightning would light it up, and you have a laser. And that's how they defeated these armies. That's how it was a weapon, and that's how they cut stone uh, without sound. And then you would take those same stones, place them in another location, and the arc would uh, rise three inches off the ground. And that's why four guys were able to carry it. They're basically just pulling it along. There's no way they could have carried that much gold with just four men with two sticks. And anyway, I just thought that was um, fascinating because I had never realized that it was um, – I knew it was some kind of laser. I just didn't know how it worked. And when I was trying to explain it, I saw the image of the glow. It's in the glow, so the light's got to go somewhere. It's going to fire out that, that, that rod. Yeah. And these were lost. They were lost after the seventh king, after uh, Solomon. Um, I believe one is buried below a river in it's over in Italy, and the other one in my book shows up on a submarine. And what's interesting is this submarine really is there. It's a Nazi U-boat, and it's about 360 feet underwater off of the Yucatan. It's right on the edge of the um, the cliff. Uh, apparently, the Yucatan. When I was doing seismic research a meteor struck that section when you look at mexico it's got a real nice curve to it where there's a 300 foot cra uh, sorry 300 mile crater down there something struck the planet there shoved all that created the yucatan and then on the other side because it's been pushed up it makes a very steep cliff on that cliff is where the nazi u-boat is it's um sort of stuck in place coral has grown over its tail and the divers as i've spoken to who tried to get into it uh, they could turn the bottom um, hatch but it's locked from the inside like with chains or something so that that ship is there um, so i just kind of embellish on what's probably probably on it in my story um in my story I also described these um these devices these guys use that are they sound incredibly futuristic like warp drives but this warp drive that i described and i give the patent number was developed by thomas thompson brown and patented in the 30s and uh, so we've had this technology for a long time, the technology to make electricity in a much easier way. That's existed for a long time. When I was in school, one of the things we were doing in physics was if you take a bowling ball and you pick it up and you walk 10 feet and you put the bowling ball down, according to the laws of physics and, and what they want in the curriculum, the only work you performed was lifting that ball up and walking across the room to set it back down that was work but in the distance you covered there was no work because it never distanced itself any higher from the the plane of the earth and that's where the the gravity's pulling on it so they don't think you're really doing any work once you got it that high and you're just holding it that high you already performed the work so let's say you take that bowling ball and you just kick it over there you performed absolutely no work and accomplished moving the bowling ball from one location to another and that's all over unity is they just figured out other ways to generate electricity without having to move heavy coils around, um, just move the, just switch the, the systems back and forth with switches, and that provides um, what they call over unity. The device puts out more power than it receives. Were there any um, specific questions you wanted to ask concerning the work? In in the work, I wanted to answer questions to people like, how do I become more spiritual? What is it Creator really wants of me? One time, someone asked my sister. You know, is there a God? What did, how, can, how can you know? And so I directed him to a book called the, um, at the time, the only book I could think of. It was The Sea Wolf by Jack London. I, I really found it interesting and kind of eye-opening and pondering questions that I normally hadn't. And so that's what I do throughout the book, those kind of questions. Like when you doubt your faith, people say, oh, okay, well, you, you've lost your faith. And I don't believe that. I believe you, you should question. The Nazis never questioned that what they were doing was wrong. I'm sure the Bush administration didn't question that what they were doing could possibly be wrong. They believed they were right. And there's nothing wrong with questioning if you're doing something right or wrong. I actually believe it's a sign of strength. And I saw a movie, and I recommend everybody watch it. If you haven't seen the um, Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh, who's turned to a movie, it's very well done. The books are amazing. And this other movie, the one I wanted to speak of, was called The... A Peaceful Warrior. It's also a book by Dan Millman. That one really takes anybody who has no real grasp 
that's what it is they're trying to do or how to become more peaceful. How do we live in this world with so much chaos and, and just people getting on your nerves? How, how can you really be at peace inside? And of course, we're always trying, if I just had that, if I just had the, uh, won the lottery, then I'd be happy. And this book, this movie addresses a lot of that. Uh, it wouldn't, it will not make you happier. It'll give you a whole lot of problems. You will be happy for a little while, but the whole happiness thing, it's part of the journey. You really just need to be, feel it inside. And when somebody upsets you, it's, you kind of give them power to upset you because they, um, that's the only power they have. And if you don't give them that power, they, they really just don't upset you. That's all uh, Gandhi and all the others did. They just didn't give anybody the power to upset them. Socrates, one of my favorite quotes from him, is he was in a marketplace and a, a mule kicked him. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, he was talking, he was debating, and someone came up and actually struck him. And then his friends get up and they say, hey, uh, let's take this up before the magistrate. You have plenty of witnesses here. You can sue this guy. And he said, I, I remember last year you were in the market and you got kicked by a jackass. He goes, I don't recall you dragging that jackass in so you could sue him. And I just thought that was a very good analogy yeah. of how to deal with things like that. Yeah, that's, I've actually been going through that change as I've been getting older, you know, learning what to, I guess, give power to like you're saying you know if it doesn't bother you it's kind of like mind over matter you know it really is that if you believe what you're doing is right and you're doing the good thing then it doesn't really matter you're gonna face opposition you know so it's mm -hmm. the struggle like you said if, if everything was given to you like a spoiled child becomes lazy so I, I think the struggle the living you know that's that's part of the journey you know because it's, it's earned then, you know, you, you understand it more. So I definitely agree with you. And uh, it's just really like having you on the show. You have a lot to say. So if you have anything else you'd like to say, keep on going. <laughs> okay. Hmm. But I uh, definitely want to get the book link out there for sure. And because um, I, I that last time I didn't get to put it in the information there and I'm gonna get a copy myself so I encourage others to do so because it's just like I said it's a breath of fresh air to hear just new points and just a new perspective on things and just I appreciate your contribution you know thanks yeah it was everything I had wanted to um, I guess impart on someone if I weren't here what information I could have left them with and I'm not perfect nowhere near it. I remember thinking if if I was being crucified or, or put to death like Jeremiah saw inside of a log and I had any kind of special abilities, I, I'd be calling for thunderbolts to be hitting these people yeah. around me. I'm not going to be forgiving them. Um, that was when I first started. And um, having been a Marine Sergeant I'm glad I never killed anyone. I can, I'm sure I can do it. I have no problems. I've been a warrior many, many times. But apparently it takes a lot away from you, your energy and your soul, um, to take another life, even if it was in self-defense. The, um, the whole concept of just allowing these things to happen, someone else tried to describe it better, and, and I, I still don't quite understand it when they say, well, you've got the witness that's the one seeing it and how they feel this this whole thing is supposed to be an illusion and i've had several examples of that shown to me there's uh, many instances where people have seen me die one time i was driving this jeep and it was this huge explosion underneath it i, I thought it was transmission actually i'm sorry i thought it was a tire because it was a lot of white smoke and, and the truck just kind of jumped to one side and so i didn't hit the brakes because you shouldn't hit the brakes if you have a blowout and i started trying to get into the central medium I was between Phoenix and Tucson and that medium is about a hundred feet wide it's just all desert and they got the, the roads far away from each other which is good so you don't get a head on collision when somebody falls asleep and while this is going on cars are moving away from me very very fast because I'm not hitting the brakes I was doing 70 so I'm coasting quite a ways before I could stop and coasting way too far with a flat tire and then there's a second explosion and uh, finally the vehicle comes to a stop and behind me were my uh, sister-in-law and her brother. I had driven to um, Phoenix 
to help take one of her sons to one of the universities down there. And I had purchased this Jeep. I thought it was a good buy, but apparently it wasn't. Um, they saw from where they were right behind me, this white explosion. They saw the truck swerve to one side and then start tumbling on its side down the highway. And that's why all the cars were pulling away as fast as they could. There was a second explosion of white smoke. They, they drove through it and I'm on the road driving just fine. And I pull over <laughs> and they both said they looked at each other. What the? I've had other friends who had something similar to that happen. An accident where all the glass broke in the car. They, they were upside down. They had their eyes closed uh, just to keep from getting glass in it. And then all of a sudden, everything seems okay. And they open their eyes and the car's right side up. None of the glass is broken. It's just sitting there idling where it had flipped over. Um, and there were two witnesses to that one. And that really makes it strange because it is kind of a um, holographic type environment where they can actually reset and, um, and protect you. So that's, that's really strange. I've seen healings where, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying like a simulation. I think we got a little internet lag here. Well, I think that's how the masters who heal finally figured it out that this is an illusion and it can just override the illusion and regrow your arm or make you see where you weren't seeing because they just, they just believe it and they believe it more than you do. One of my friends was in a, into karate and he was really into the, the Zen side of everything and the, the mystical side of stuff. He would jump off cliffs in the desert. He'd go to the desert specifically to jump off cliffs. I'm talking like a good 50 feet down and we wouldn't get hurt. And he said that, uh, that the, the tr true masters of that, the coyotes, the curanderos are called, called coyotes, not the people that traffic people around, um, illegal immigrants, they could actually jump up the cliffs. And he gave this one example to me where he had a friend of his go out there to watch him do it. So he went to the edge of the cliff and it was about 45 foot drop. So he jumped down and then he walked around to come back up because you couldn't come up the cliff, it was too sharp. And his friend's still standing there looking over the cliff when he gets there. And he walks up beside him, he goes, that was cool, huh? And the guy jumped, he was startled. He goes, and he looked back down, he goes, you were laying there dead. I didn't know what to do. You just, you were dead. And he said, no, no, I, I landed, I, I ran around, came back up. He goes, no, you, you hit the ground and you splattered. And um, then he had another incident where he was, he was on something. I don't know what it was, but uh, he had some friends. They were all drinking beer. He was walking in his living room. He tripped and fell, um, hit ground, uh, hit the carpet and he looked around and, and a table of glass is behind him. It's a little coffee table, but it's all glass with beer bottles on it. And he has to crawl out from under it. And his friends were all laughing at this. And he said, did you just see what happened? Yeah, you fell on the table, broke it. And he goes, it's not broken. And they couldn't figure it out because they saw it break. They saw him fall through it and break it, but it wasn't broken. And what I discovered from that was um, when they're trying to test you for ESP and they got a camera on you, all of a sudden, it doesn't work anymore. And I think that's why Jesus maybe chose the time to come when he did. And the masters all chose because there were no recording devices back then. Because if I'm, if I'm looking at the camera and I don't believe you're doing, you're going to be able to do what you're supposed, you're saying you can do, my belief influences you. There's no time involved in this. So you won't be able to perform it. Um, when Jesus was in his hometown, they, they sort of short-circuited him. him. They didn't believe he could do the things that he was supposed to be able to do. And they literally shorted the power of a creator. He should have been able to, to walk on water, and yet they don't believe it, so he's going to go in the water. And um, that's kind of protecting us, that, that type of, of belief, that energy, because we've been dumbed down so much that – we're just in a constant survival mode. We got to get up. We got to go to work. We, we can't miss a day even if we're sick because we're going to fall behind on our bills. We're already slightly you know, on the edge as it is. And that, that's a belief. And there's a fear that maybe you won't make the rent. And that fear gives it energy. And if enough of us believe that, it doesn't matter if the sun's going crazy and fires a flare. That flare will not affect us because enough of us believe we have to go to work. We have to be there tomorrow. We have to you know, be at the end of the week 
week or the month or go to this birthday party or this concert that's coming up. And somehow that's creating an, an energy field around the planet that seems to be protecting us because several events took place that should not have happened and we should have been hurt. There was a Jupiter effect back in 82. Several satellites were lost. We didn't get hurt down here. There was that incident in 2003 where the sun fired. They think it was an X-45 away from us. That's the one that uh, Major Ed Dames was talking about that was going to fire the kill shot. Wow. If we'd have been three months further into time and, and it hit us, we would have, I, I think, died. Um, it wiped out several satellites, and these satellites were supposed to be able to record that that event, one of these events. But what they did was they said, okay, the sun fires this flare, let's call that a C, and then if it goes 10 times that, we'll call it an A, we'll go you know, a 2C, a 3C, a 4C, and if it becomes 10 times all that, then it becomes an M class. And it goes, just like, just like earthquakes, 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, and then you get a, a 10, a, well, a 9, an M9, and then it goes to an X class. And then it keeps on multiplying until you get to the, what they thought X20 would be the highest. They didn't think it could even go there. So they just built their scale to go to X20. And they didn't think anything would ever do that. Those scales pegged. And the devices that were supposed to be measuring this, they went static for 12 minutes. Two of the satellites were fried. And it didn't even, it wasn't aimed at us. It was aimed over there. You just kind of caught the light coming from the side of the, of the glare. And that wiped them out. So the sun is capable of incredible destructive um, capabilities. I just posted something on my Facebook where the sun is just pulsing. It's just super bright, dim, super bright, dim, super bright, dim. And it's being videotaped that it's doing that. My girlfriend had a terrible headache today. She was not able to continue working. She had to go home. And I checked my solar monitor. She picks it up before my monitors do. And the sun's gone, fired. It's into the... The six range, it rarely hits the six range, five, four. And that's only what's hitting us, what's being measured and being given to us, the um, K band, I think they call it. Yeah. Anyway, we, um, we have been getting hit with a lot of things. The, what is that, um, Yellowstone? That's a bad one. Um, that was, I think that motivated me to write the book more than anything else because I was concerned about that. And when they made the movie 2012, and you got Yellowstone, right? They originally, the movie, remember, it was supposed to come out, and then it was delayed. It didn't come out till 2013. Yeah. Well, originally, they had, uh, there was an interloper, another planet came in, and it just happened to be red, and it, it was, was, was causing all the destruction on Earth. And the government apparently said, uh, no, no, you're going to have to come up with something else. So they did the, um, the, the Yellowstone out. volcano. At the end of the, the movie though where all the ships are sailing into the sunset that wouldn't happen there'd be a dark thick black blanket of, of soot up there for about 10 years at the very least too that um that would be like a nuclear winter and there would be no no nice sunshine yeah. so anyway we we have been in danger of so many things going wrong um there's like 20 different things that that could have gone wrong and and there would be a lot less humans on the planet and all of them have been thwarted, every single one of them. So um, we really have been receiving a lot of protection. Um, I spoke of Neil Donald Walsh earlier. I don't know if, how many people have ever heard of him. I've never. He and, <clears throat> I was in the library and I saw the audios of um, Conversations with God. He was, he'd broken his neck. He was out of work. Um, Lost everything. I think this was his fourth marriage. <clears throat> and, and he had just got a job for a little while. And he was kind of just venting, you know, really upset. Why is this crap always happening? Why does this have to happen to me? And then he kind of heard a voice. And he said it was kind of a combination of male, female. Not sure what it was, but it wasn't his voice. Just one that came in. He said, are you just venting or do you really want to know? And so he started writing that down, the conversations he was having. And they're really interesting conversations. Because at one point he asked, why do you actually send people to, to hell if they commit suicide? And the answer is, I don't send anyone to hell. Some have gone of their own accord, and we try and get them back out of there. But I, I, why would I send you to hell? The concept you have of religion, the religion that pushes that, is you have, let's take a rope. And it, it's infinity in one direction, infinity in the other direction of time, because he's infinite. 
and you're gonna take a razor blade and lay it on top of there, that's your lifetime. If you don't get it right within this lifetime, your future from that point forward is eternal damnation. Because is why would I do that? You, you are me. I am you. There's only one. I would never do that. And uh, the other question about the suicide, he said, what difference does it make to me if you use a gun or a cigarette or riding fast on a motorcycle to commit suicide? It's, uh, you know, one just takes longer than the other. Yeah. And I never really looked at it that way. But there was a time when he said, okay, why do we keep coming back? Why do we keep coming back to this planet? I mean, what's the point? Who cares? You, got, you did it once. It's over, right? And he asked him, uh, you're involved in a relationship, aren't you? He goes, yeah, it's going pretty good, isn't it? Well, this one is, yeah. Every now and then you get intimate with your partner, don't you? Well, yeah. He says, why? You know how it's going to start. You certainly know how it's going to end. Why go through all that again? And he said, it's because of the actual experience of going through it. Like when we sit, put a movie on in the cassette, you're holding the DVD. And if you've seen the movie before, you know where it begins. You know where it ends. But to actually sit through there and go through it and you get all the emotions again or the excitement, it, you're moving through. You slow time down and you're actually living through the emotion. And that's what we're doing here, sort of. Yeah. Experience. And then when you wake up. <laughs> like uh... – a couple of my friends always explained it as like uh, you're experiencing, you know, the simulation of God or, you know, the creator of all almost like within our lifetime, you know, like a, just the essence of it. And I thought that was kind of a neat way to put it because in, in, the, in the same way we are, because we manifest and create everything, whether it's, you know, a sandwich or, you know, the rest of your life, you know, it all starts with thought and yeah, just you brought up some really good points. I also have argued against the, the possibility that we manifest everything. I really don't think we do. Because within my sphere, I didn't manifest 9-11. That was the will of other individuals enforcing their will on us. And uh, I don't think people should blame themselves or feel that they caused certain things to take place. I, I really do not believe. Some say, oh, you couldn't even get up this morning if it wasn't for God, you know, giving you breath. Um, I really don't believe that. This one, it's a book called um, Path Less Traveled, I believe. And this guy's son, he, he was, uh, he had that disease where you age very rapidly and die in your teens, your early teens. And this little boy was actually in pain every single day of his life and would continue to be in pain until he died. He's a kind of a sick, distant God would torture this little child, cause him pain every day of his life, and then finally kill him at about 14. And he came to the conclusion that he wouldn't. And he might be going through it, and for whatever reason, his little soul decided he needed to, to come in this way. Um, and the kid was great. He played violin. He did all kinds of stuff, and something that would probably completely wipe me out. But there are people that I see that... Um, these unbelievable handicaps and they still accomplish incredible things and then um, yeah, there's just some little setback I have and uh, it's over I'm pissed that's it I just bring on everything kill everybody I'm tired of this because I do have that I do get upset and lately I've been getting more upset mainly because I know what the world should be like and it's been stopped over and over and over but in my research especially with the timelines I discovered that um the timeline of the apocalypse, the, the apocalypse that's in the Bible, in that timeline, and this is all my own theory from my own research, in that timeline, Kennedy was not assassinated. I've looked into the Kennedy assassination. It is fascinating just how many people were there to shoot him. There's guns from every window. There was about 35 different films made. There's one that was over in Italy. It took me a while to track it down. It was a copy of the one across from the street, the car's coming down, you hear it slow down. There, when we watch it, there, there's no sound. It slows down, takes off. There was sound to this one. And they didn't add the sound. You hear the shot when he's by the sign, and he's coming across, you hear another shot. And then as he gets to the grassy knoll, there's about five or six shots all at the same time. But when he's getting to the grassy knoll, the driver is slowing down. He's going like this, he's ducking. The guy in front, he's ducking too. And the driver has a pistol in his hand. It, it looks like a python um, 
Snub nose. He's got it right here, 357 Python. And you can make out the little ridges that a six cylinder would have. So he's like ducking down like this and, and slowing down. You see the police uh, motorcycles pass him up because he's actually slowing down so they can get a better shot at him. And um, so they all start shooting and it's, it looks like the driver goes back and shoots him also just to make sure that he's dead because he's hitting the brakes and he's going forward and he fires again. Connolly's suit would have had gunpowder all over it. They dry cleaned it before the, the case went up. They reupholstered the car because of all the bullet holes. And um, Kennedy is shot from the grassy knoll. He's shot from the side where that police officer shot him. And the women that are standing there, if you take a, that picture from that film and then you take the Zapruder film, they're not standing in the right place. They're switched. And what they finally figured out was that so the pruder had taken his camera and scanned everything to get a, a good idea of where he wanted to, what he wanted to pan and take. And then he finally filmed it. Here comes Kennedy. Okay, what they did was they, they cut the film. They took the first pan and they placed it back there. And then they put the actual film where he was shot there. So as Kennedy's going by, people are still waiting for him to come down. They're looking around. They don't even seem to notice he's going by. And as he gets in front here, you know, he gets shot. Um, that's that's not the actual film, and you should look it up if you want uh, Zapruder stuff. That's, it took them 26 years to figure out that's what they, they had done. They did a pretty good job of it, but they, there's several mistakes you can see. So anyway, back to Kennedy being assassinated. If he had not been assassinated, Kennedy did not like the um, money we were spending on weapons, aircraft carriers, that sort of thing. And his Peace Corps, what he envisioned, was people having the money, going to other countries, building schools, building clinics, um, educating these individuals, building roads, bringing clean water and electricity. And if you can imagine a world where Americans were doing that to the rest of the world, bringing everybody up, up to at least modern civilization, people would want Americans in their country. And uh, then he would have stepped down and his brother would have had another, what, uh, eight years. So in a world like that, people would have been happier and healthier, and he would have actually put in the laws that would have reformed the system. The wars would have been done with, done away with. And in a world like that, they would easily go over to a, what's it called, a, a one world system. Are you still there? My yeah. computer's done something weird. I'm listening. Oh, lost the screen. Okay, well in that world, um, they would have been able to go to a one world system and they would have been happy to have the United States government lead that system. And now you have the perfect makings for a one world order, a one world banking system, a one world religion, and the one world leader. And under those conditions was when um, we were in this area of space and humans were growing those crystals in their brain. And they would have had like a bumper crop of these crystals, the, uh, the ones who are not so nice they would have been able to access all these crystals once the, the apocalypse happened and people died. And then they could have made them into the, um, the blue apple technology because that's what they're from. Anyway, once they did that, then everything that happened in the future, everything that took place on this planet, uh, not the planet, but the galaxy, um, all the bad destruction that took place, that, that was the future we came back from. The, uh, the one where everything went wrong. The technology got into the wrong hands and they were able to uh, get past the fourth dimension and the, the fifth dimension, what we call reptilians, I guess, or the what we see as the elite down here. And I, for a long time, I didn't believe the reptilian thing. I mean, it was there, it was on the back burner. I'm <laughs> just thinking, okay, well, maybe there is some of this stuff. It's all over the Bible, if you know where to see it, where to look for it. And it's in our history. When they broke into the... Um, into the museums during the, not the Gulf War, this one where they went out to Kuwait. Yeah. They were supposed to secure those museums and protect them. They were supposed to have soldiers around them. There was a list of locations they were supposed to protect. They did not protect that museum. They looted it themselves. There's videotapes out there of Blackwater breaking into these safes. Some of them were special combination locks, two or three different systems in there. They stole statues that weighed 27 tons. 
and they took all the cuneiforms from taken from World War One to World War Two that had not been translated yet, and a lot of those small little um, what are they called those little things they press against the clay and they get that little pictogram, mm -hmm. and some of those showed reptilians. They're looking for something. It's called the I believe it's what they're looking for are called the plates of destiny. And the plates of destiny are a special nanotechnology. You can place them on your skin, whoever selected, they would select someone for this. Let's say they select a Cheney for this. And uh, they place these on his on him. When they place these on him, the nanotechnology binds with you. And so it doesn't come off anymore. You don't need to eat anymore. It's gonna prepare, repair your body. It's gonna rejuvenate you. And it also links you with all the um, pyramids on the planet and it links you to some other AI stuff that's here. And you become so powerful that if, all you have to do is think someone dead and they're dead. Of course, you're supposed to use it for good. Think water and rain and things like that. But that's what they were looking for. They're called the plates of destiny. That's why they were mapping the world with the satellite to see what was underground, where these pyramids were underground, so they could um, locate them. There's a pyramid in a uh, working operating pyramid in Alaska, and there's um, several underwater. And anyway, this was a technology from the, the war that, that took place about 9,600, 9,006 years ago. So uh, um, anyway, that's why we're here. That war went really bad. Um, we basically lost it. And uh, there was no way to, to make the changes in the future until you came back to the past. Have you seen the, the movie of the, uh, the last one, I think it was, of X-Men? where they're about to die, they created a special machine that can duplicate all their abilities or, or mimic all their abilities. The yeah, and so they have to send uh, Wolverine back into the past to um, correct the problem, sort of alter it. And that's exactly what happened. That was the only alternative. Everybody's going to die. There's no way to stop this. Uh, there's no other way to get out of there. So the souls were selected, and they were um, asked to come back to Earth and try and raise the vibration. Basically, when you came here, you would have your mind wiped, just like you normally do, and then you would be, uh, you'd be trying to find creator, I guess, all over again. Yeah. Without a real, <clears throat> without anybody really guiding you, no mentor, because the church isn't gonna help you, and the priests certainly weren't a good example. And um, in doing so, we, we raised the consciousness, which prevented a lot of the destruction. But I also, uh, remember we were talking about black goo, yeah. A while back. Yes. The planet, the Saturn sized planet, and I was, I was speculating that the black goo was all over that, that planet. In the research I've been doing, you've heard of prison planet? Yeah. This being a prison planet? Well, that was a prison planet. It was designed by some type of AI a long time ago, and I'm talking millions of years. What the AI in the wars, whatever wars those were, those ancient wars, they figured out that against the living, their main problem was these particular souls that kept coming back. The you know the ones that like Patton, Crazy Horse, these these individuals that just persevered against. Uh, didn't matter what it was, they were going to they were going to destroy you. Yeah. Didn't matter how good their programs were, they were going to find a way around it. They were going to motivate everybody. People were going to follow them, and they were going to um, to win. So they didn't want to kill these people because they kept coming back. What they did was they created this planet where they would place you on it, and you weren't being punished or anything. You were just it's fending for yourself or whatever. It was, it was a rather nice planet, good environment, a lot of oxygen. But when you died, you left the planet, and then you moved toward the light, and you were zapped like a bug and brought back down to the planet, and you were born again with your mind wiped. And I know you've heard of that. Yeah. Anyway, oh, excuse me. Because Earth is a piece of that, that planet, I think that's what's happening here. Way too many people are describing that incident, the part about stay away from the white light, don't walk toward the white light. Yeah. Golden white light is good, violet, blue, <clears throat> anything but just pure white. And if you don't know where to go, just call for help, call for angels, and they'll, they'll take you should you transition. But apparently, um, because we came in under uh, orders, when we die we're sort of escorted out of here, but the actual humans are not, and they're recycled. And that's why you have such an incredibly large, <clears throat> disproportionate amount of um, pedophiles 
uh, psychopaths because they've been placed on this planet for millennia. When the planet exploded, they were here. Their souls were captured. I don't know. The aliens managed to escape with the rest of the planet exploded. But the reptilians figured out it's a prison planet, and they've been using it for that. Yeah, it's definitely quarantined, it seems. Uh, in the, and you look back at the ancient texts, that's apparent through many cultures. I've actually went over that a few times from different readings I had. It seems like, uh, to me, like it, it's just like you're saying, you got to make like a stable plasma body. That way, when you're reincarnating, you can have your memory essentially but if you don't do that you basically can be wiped clean you know and you just come back and be an amnesia almost well like i said we we're not here because we were evolving to the next level we came back specifically to uh, simply alter what happened make it less terrible yeah Kind of like a reverse Terminator effect. Instead of going back to kill the resistance, you're going back to create it almost. <laughs> you know? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, and if we were doing what Christ said to do, actually just try and not be so, uh, I guess, love your neighbor, love your enemy, the reptilians would actually die. They wouldn't be fed anymore. Um, Hold up, let me look for something real quick. It's a cough drop. Oh, you're fine. Any allergies in here? They modified humans in such a way that, okay, well, the Anunnaki had modified us. But uh, apparently, the, the new design they created put their reptilian brain at the base of ours. And, uh, and then all they have to do is keep us in survival mode and we just stay in that reptilian brain now if christ was on the cross he had a reptilian brain because he was human but he was not in that lower mind he was at the highest altruistic part of the triangle and that's what assisted him in changing over into a light body and a light body why would anybody want a light body why are we striving for a light body what would be the importance of a light body <clears throat> i don't think we were i don't think this whole thing was planned out as a light body but what i'm hearing from creator this was one of the possibilities in a light body, you don't age. You can change your appearance. You can um, change your height. You can change. That's why they couldn't recognize Christ when he had resurrected, because you can change your appearance. You um, walk on water. You basically walk through walls. You can teleport. You can do. It's like a super Jedi, kind of, with all these incredible powers. Somehow, in the future, the um, there are are six billion light bodies in the galaxy. And the Pleiadians, uh, when they found that out with their time travel um, research they do, they tried to figure out, figure out where these light body beings came from, these masters. And they came from Earth. Um, planets don't normally have these many people on them. They try to keep it down to about 500 million. And this planet has seven billion now, a soul, you don't create a soul when you have a child. You create the body. And apparently, the, um, the female has a stargate. She's been designed as a stargate. When they designed the female, she was way different than the male. She was like the Mark II, uh, faster thinking brain. You ever try to play 20 questions with a female? You're not going to win. Their minds just think so fast. And they have a better immune system, better everything. But in their womb, there's an actual, and the structure of their, their auric field, they actually create a time portal, a, a matrix. And in this matrix, you come through it, and then um, the body they create is specifically designed to match the harmonic resonance of the being who's going to be their child, the one who's already been preselected by, by you and by them before you were born. Once it's linked, the, um, it enters the body and then gets connected to it, becomes a body, and then, of course, it's born. And the lady, Sophia, 
Stewart, who wrote The Matrix, I was talking to her about that, and she was saying that the um, that's what the movie The Matrix is. Everybody has to pass through the Matrix to come to the world. And it took me a while to think about until she um, was able to explain it better. But, uh-oh, are you there? Yeah. The um, whole Matrix thing, um, this world is, is that sort of illusion. And the Matrix Stargates, they need you to, um, how would I say, in order to be here, your body had to be designed specifically to resonate at a certain frequency. And then you have your soul and the closest thing you get your mind wiped and everything. But before you were ever selected to come here, you were you had to be a master. There's no way you could just be a regular person. You had to be a master. You would have had to have been a warrior. You had to have gone through so many wars and, and been a lot like Buddha or Christ or something like that on, on their own terms to even be selected to come to earth. And once we're here, of course, we're, um, I've been struggling with this a lot, this whole complex uh, complexity, I guess, of inferiority, especially to others. Like maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm, I'm not the one that should write this book. Um, that is something we really have to work on because it's so destructive. E- even our language is destructive. Um, in our language, we believe it. There's a, you, you may have heard this story. I used to know the name of the guy. I don't know it anymore. But there was an individual. They were selling these boxcars. And the boxcars were refrigerated boxcars. It was back around the Depression. And he got curious to see what these refrigerated boxcars looked like inside. So he went in one, and someone came up behind him, closed the door, locked it, and kept on going because they were supposed to close them up at the end of the day. He couldn't get out. He was banging on on the door. Um, nobody was coming. So he starts uh, starts shivering and then eventually he stops shivering. So he figures he's going to die. He takes out his pencil that he has and starts writing on the, on the walls and the floor, his last will and testament. And then he starts thinking, okay, well, I think I've been here maybe uh, two hours. And my, my I can't talk. My mouth is numb. I can't hardly use my fingers. I'm not shaking anymore. I feel euphoric. So he's, he's trying to give scientists something to go with you know, so his death won't be um, totally useless. And when they open it up in the morning, he's there on the floor solid as a rock and they take him and, and end up doing an autopsy on, on him he was he'd frozen to death the problem is the box car wasn't working that's why they were being sold so your mind is that powerful and hypnotism has always amazed me i don't know if you've ever seen any hypnotist shows lately but just the, when you're in a just like um i don't know just a small room or a, a good sized little room with the magi- the guy in front of you where well, you're seeing what's happening they can't you can't you shouldn't be able to do the things they can do and one of the most amazing ones was in the book the holographic universe that was a really fascinating one this man was hypnotized he would not see his child <clears throat> he would not see his little girl she was in the room she was giggling and laughing he couldn't hear her and so the guy um, had him, had her stand right in front of him he says can you see her is she in the room? You can't see her. So he takes a, a pocket watch, places it on her back, and he opens it <clears throat> on her back, places it up against her back. And he says, there's something written on this inside this watch. Can you read it for me? He leans forward looking at his daughter, and he reads what's on the watch. Hmm. How do you do that? And the way you do that is that you are a piece of creator you are one with everything and you know where every single molecule is in the universe at all times when you get down to that level so i kind of tried to work with that for treasure hunting okay i know where the ships went i know where the gold is i will find it i don't think i'm anywhere near capable, uh, capability of doing that although i have have had some really fascinating um, treasure hunting experiences and just experiences and finding things and i'll give you an example of a few of them one time, my ex was feeling, these These are all powers we really have. And if we just, um, I don't know, opened up or followed that little still voice that tells you to do things, you would, they would start to awaken in us. And this was really fascinating. Uh, she was feeling really frustrated, anxious, uh, almost anxiety attack. And a long time ago, when um, my stepson, the youngest one, he would cry every morning when he'd wake up. He would just cry and cry. Took him to the hospital, to the doctor. Nobody knew why he was crying. And so I prayed about it. And the answer was, well, you can't communicate with him, so 
connect to his uh, lower chakra at his base of his spine. Place your hand, but he must be touching his skin. So I touched his skin, and I felt I felt the fear, and I felt hunger, and I felt I was going to die of starvation. And so I had to do some research on that. Well, some work on that prayer and stuff, and found out that he had died of starvation in his last lifetime. <clears throat> so every morning when he woke up, we had a baggie there with um, these uh, cinnamon crackers in it. And he's never cried again because he just had to have something near him. I had heard that this one priest was having trouble with children in an orphanage who wouldn't go to sleep. So they'd give him a little um, loaf of bread, the little round ones, just to hold it overnight. You know, didn't just hang on to it. And then children could sleep because they were so terrified to not have anything to eat the next day. They couldn't go to sleep. So I placed my hand in her lower back and this, this window opens up right in front of me and I'm seeing this, Banana seat bicycle. It's purple and white. It's got these streamers hanging off of it. Um, really nice bike. And it's up against this tree here in Texas called the Lila, China berry tree. And I could see her parents' house, which I'd only seen a couple times. And I'm describing it. And I said, someone stole that bike. She said, yes. And you know who stole it? She said, yes. And they painted it, didn't they? Yeah. <clears throat> and you knew that was your bike, but they wouldn't uh, admit to it ever. I said, you have to forgive them. It's not doesn't mean you're justifying it. You're just letting it go. And she uh, she did that, and she felt fine. Then I said, you know, I don't remember ever seeing that tree there at your at your parents' house. She goes, oh, no, my dad cut it down when he put the fence up. So stuff like that is just really out there, and it's just a really cool power to just all of a sudden have. There was another one where um, I entered my brother's house, and he's really frustrated. He's got this really amazing sound system. And he bought all these remote controls that don't, uh, they don't quite operate everything. And he's looking for his remote, but he can't find it. He's got a little two and a half year old that probably lost it. So he asked me to, he goes, can you help me find my remote control? And then all of a sudden from this side, it's just like a, the sun reflecting off a windshield it starts getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And I just stopped listening to him and start doing digging through the, um, it was a, a special lazy boy kind of chair, but I felt and I didn't, there was nothing there. So I went and got some dousing equipment that I have and I started dousing for it. I found five remotes and I said, okay, put them all in the bag, hold on to these so I don't keep finding them. And then I started getting really weird hits where there was nothing at the glove compartment, the side of the door in the car, there's one drawer over here. And what I was finding, I found out later through research was something called a trash thought. That's like, you've lost your keys and I'm going to try and help you find your keys and you visualize that you might have put them in a drawer next to your bed. That's just your imagination that it's there. I will actually follow that as the keys really being there. Yeah. That that's really crazy that I found, you know, I was able to target your your mind, you you picture something there and I went there looking for it. So that was something I wasn't expecting and it's very difficult when you're treasure hunting, especially if a lot of people have been in the area imagining where the treasure is and they sort of dirtied up the water. Anyway, that was really an, an interesting power. And I did find the remote. It was right where it was actually reached behind uh, the, the seat on the ground. There was a special fold of, of leather there, and that's where it was. So I was seeing through the material all the way back. It didn't matter. It just was there. You know, I just didn't know. I'd never seen that happen before, so I didn't know what to do. Well, my brother, he likes to, he likes to gamble and try things. So he was in um, Louisiana where they have a lot of the casinos. And he calls me up, and he says, I've lost my numbers. So I can't find my numbers. I said, what? I'm at a roulette wheel. I've lost my numbers. I can't find my numbers. Can you find my numbers the way you found my remote? So I said, okay, 19, 17, 13, 11, and the green ones. And um, in that order. And he won $290 because he, was, he wasn't betting that high because he didn't know what was going to happen. And I went there myself and did something very similar to that. Um, so that was really cool. Um, what I found out from remote viewing, and this was really fascinating, they would take two pieces of envelope, two envelopes. Inside each of the pair of envelopes was a location to go to. So the test person would be given the envelope. Say, go out. And they would drive around town for 30 minutes, big city. And then they'd open it up and they said, go to like San Antonio, the hemisphere. So go to the top of the hemisphere. So then the person sitting there, still in the remote, he he's supposed to try and locate her in the city. And then they'll open it up and see if he's right. Well, this person no longer just leaves it out the door and he says, I know where she's going to be. He goes, she doesn't know where she's going to be. How can you know where she's going to be? I'm telling you, I know where she's going to be. And he gives them the exact location. And so they 
open up the envelope and that's where it says for her to go. Now, if you had an assassin who knew where you were going to be in 30 minutes, even though you didn't know where you were going to be in 30 minutes, that would be one hell of an assassin. Yeah. So these, these powers are really fascinating, the things we can actually do. And I've always hoped that I could teach people how to do that someday or work towards that. I think I will one day. I've done some incredible healings. People that had um, gangrene, when they, when they do a surgery on you and they don't stitch you back up, I guess they just kind of tape it together. And so it heals on its own, which is a weird way to do it. But this woman, she was, it was very hot and she was sweating a lot and she ended up getting gangrene. She was going to go to the hospital to have all that removed. And uh, my mom and I went over to visit her. And as I was going over there, I said, Mom, we, we can't pray for her unless she actually asks us to. And we were there all weekend, and she never asked. And we're leaving, and then she, she comes out, um, could you guys pray for me? She was an evangelist also. So we went in the house, and it ended up becoming an exorcism, to make a long story short. But she had to be at the hospital in two hours to get her surgery. And they sent her home. There was nothing wrong with her. So it just that fast. I know, I know it's possible to heal people that fast. It's just um, having and holding that mindset. And that's kind of what I, I, I don't know, I hope someday to be able to, to reach and teach others how to do that. Um, when I was bending spoons, I don't know if you ever looked into bending spoons. I read so many books on bending spoons, and I could not bend a single spoon. Finally, I met this guy. Uh, I think his name was Jack Hawk. He was in California, and he would do sp uh, spoon bending parties. First, he would show you how to use the dowsing rod for answering questions, much like using a dowser, the, the little pendulum thing. And then he showed us how to bend spoons. And I bent spoons very easily, the, especially the part where it's got the cup on it, just fold it in on itself. It's like bending paper. It has no resistance whatever. And they say that after they, you bend something like that and you take pictures, if you take, if you take special um, photographs, at very high magnification, you'll find stress cracks throughout the, the actual spoon. But once you do the bending, there's no more stress cracks. Everything's perfectly smooth. And children are the best for this. You can give them um, a hacksaw blade and tell them, hey, turn this into a curly Q fry. And they'll do that. And you know that hacksaw blades would break if they bent that way. But they'll, they'll shape in themselves in that way. And then someone gave me a, a really big spoon, really big, gigantic aluminum spoon. And I could not bend that. Uh, I mean, I was like, I tried everything, and I even tried my force. It didn't move. And I turned around, and this girl that went with me, she was very petite, but I knew she would, if I gave her the suggestion, she would follow it. And I said, here, bend the spoon. I know you can do it. And she instantly bent the, I mean, it was the size of my hand, the bolt. She instantly bent it and then twisted it all up and it actually broke in half. So, um, I've just seen some amazing things. And we can do all these things, just we're not taught that. Um, when they did the whole thing about the government tested people to see if they, they had uh, ESP abilities, they basically went um, on the street, picked up the regular guy off the street, and tested them for abilities. Nobody had them. They didn't go and test athletes, you know, people who were already trained in this because they were biased. They believed it worked. That would be like taking 10 people off the street and seeing they could run a four-minute mile, and they couldn't. Then that's also uh, the four-minute mile, Roger Bannister. Nobody could run a four-minute mile. It was impossible because your human, the human heart would explode. But Roger Bannister kept pushing and believing he could do it. And once Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile, within weeks, another 12 people had done it. But nobody could do it until someone actually broke that barrier. And, and we have those limitations placed on us when we're little. Once we grow up, this, this, is, this is possible. This can't happen. And we sort of have to retrain ourselves to um, believe these things are possible, but really believing them is a, there's a major block, just like Neo, Neo in the matrix where he jumps off the building. He sees what he sees, um, more do it, but when he tries it, it doesn't quite work. And, and you can try and believe as much as you want, but it doesn't work right away. So, um, these, these abilities, when I see someone do something, I can do it. So I've always wanted to go see someone levitate because that's one thing I've always wanted to do. I think I could learn it once I saw someone do it. That um, reading the books doesn't seem to help, even though I know all the techniques and everything I'm supposed to clear my mind. Oh, starting fires? <clears throat> Take a candle and um, just think at it to flicker, and it'll do it. it. It works really well. Hold a match, light a match, hold it in front of you, and, and think, turn it off, and it'll turn off. 
um, if you don't think turn off, it'll just keep burning. That's one of the easier ones to do. Um, moving objects, I've, I've done that. It also gets out of hand, though. Um, in the Marine Corps, I was trying to bend a piece of metal, and I took a, a thick, very thick paper clip, and I just kept running my finger on it because I didn't have a nail. And I was just say bend, bend, bend. I fall asleep that way. And then when, uh, one night, I had a lot of, a lot of, of different little uh, nightmares. And I woke up, and it was bent at 45 degree angle. And I thought, oh, me. Maybe I got caught between a pillow and the sheets and somehow got stressed. You know, I was caught just right in it. And um, later throughout the day, I was in a vehicle. I was cleaning it, and all of a sudden, I just moved back four feet and slammed into the, the boundary that was there. And the, it was in park. It wasn't on. Nobody hit the vehicle. And then I was walking past a, some cars at the mall there on basement, Marine Corps base. And this one car starts coming back, and you hear it. Mission ratcheting, making a horrible ratcheting sound, being pulled back toward me. And I just thought something was wrong with the car. Until um, I went into this, this room in the Marine Corps, uh, the women's rooms, they are two to a room, and they have to have the window thing open and the door open. And there's a guy in the room, there's a guy sitting there talking to his girlfriend. And this girl went to borrow my car, so um, she had asked me to go over there. So I gave her the keys, I gave her the keys. And when I turned around, walking out, and they all come out of the room screaming. This is walk past that teddy bear that's on the ground. He looked at you. He stood up and walked to the edge of the shelf and jumped off. So um, that's when I was reading about things. Hold on a sec. That seems to be what takes place with these um, kids all at the age of puberty. I guess I have extra energy or something. And all these um, weird manifestations start happening around these kids. Um, one of the most horrible ones I heard about, the craziest ones, this judge is happening, his girls were about that age, and this weird thing started happening back in the 18th century. They go outside, though, but really malicious things start happening if you don't know how to control it. His horse, one of his horses, was in the, uh, right in front of the steps, it had his hind hoof shoved into his throat. And, uh, you know, at least thinking it really out of hand, I guess. Um, I'm not sure how this power works, but if you don't know how to control it, it gets away really quick, especially if you're doing like, a, I guess, lifting tables or Ouija board, any of those things. Um, it's one thing to, to have it start happening, but what happens is people become scared, and all that is is belief. So if you really believe it, when you're scared, you really believe something. It just empowers uh, almost like the, the bad things happen. So I was just people not do that. And then when I started using, I guess they say, surround yourself with light and pray, and things went a lot better. But um, just some of the more interesting things I found, interesting things I've been able to do, and um, hopefully be able to teach somebody one day, especially the spoon bending. That's Joseph, hold on one cool. second. Hold on one second. Because it shows you this is an Hold on one sec. We gotta let our internet catch up here. We got a little uh, malfunction. It's just, just a little lag. This should be. He should be good now. <clears throat> Have you heard anything about the children in China that they're working with? Uh, this one little girl can turn her hair white. And back to black. Um, kids can run through walls. They can uh, take um, little medicine pills. Cases. It's like a lot harder to find out the. Any in there? Stuff. Hold on one second. I don't. I think we got a little uh, internet lag problem here. You just kind of. Started sounding like you were talking really fast. I can hear you now, though. Okay. Um, several countries are, are working with these children, the ones that we call ADD or um, what was that other stuff? Um, I think that's why the vaccines have the mercury in them. 
they're basically lobotomizing these kids so that they don't develop these capabilities here in the U.S. But in the other countries, they're actually trying to enhance these capabilities. Uh, it's just something that that they can do. They they levitate. I levitated when I was little. Uh, I have several examples of that stuff that was impossible to me to do unless I did levitate. But I think that these vaccines, they're they're basically doing it to lobotomize these kids so that they don't um, start developing these incredible capabilities. Supposedly, though, um, from what I understand, the off-worlds can reverse all that and correct it very quickly. Um, what else? The technologies that are out there are – I have a friend right now in Hawaii who is powering his house, the house he's staying at, and that's how he's paying for the rent, with uh, op, the, just an energy grid. The, the energy is coming off the um, lightning from the sun or the – the static electrical field around Earth, that's what he's powering the house with. So he's, uh, they gave him a big break on the rent. And Hawaii, the electricity is really expensive. Um, the devices that draw more energy, how do you say? When I was working with the metal detectors, I built several, designed a few. I quickly figured out these, uh, how some of these, these patents work. You know when you have a card and you scan it and it'll it'll you won't even touch the thing you just run the card and it it knows you're there. Okay, that uh, it's sending out a signal. Your card has a little wire that runs around the outside like an antenna. The antenna picks up the electricity. That electricity gets converted into power for the chip. The chip then uh, charges its little capacitor with more of that energy hitting it, and then it sends out a pulse. So it gives you identification. Um, if you had an antenna synchronized to the Earth's resonance field, which is changing, um, your house would simply be on. It would just, all the electricity would be there. you just draw it right out of the atmosphere because that's where it is in the atmosphere. Um, I really wish we could build some of these things, and I think I'll get a chance to pretty soon, but there, there would be almost no wars if we had all these. And, and, of course, in the other timeline where Kennedy was, these devices were available. They were all made available. There's over 5,000 patents that are being gagged right now. Um, anyway, I, I go into that in the book, and one of the characters is always upset that uh, they're holding all this technology and using it and not sharing it with the world. He goes, what do you think we got it from? Their patent offices. You know, they've, they've had these. They were invented long ago. You know, Anti-gravity, medical devices that, that just cure you instantly with the electricity. Um, royal rife he was a doctor and he had been working with um an x-ray tube that he ordered to be modified and he had developed a special type of telescope that could see a uh, microscope that could see smaller than uh, anybody else could see and what he saw in the cancer cells were these tiny little roach looking creatures but they looked like they were made out of crystal crystalline transparent and he was able to photograph these things. And he thought, just like the, hitting a C note and breaking glass, could I hit the right note and break these things? And he did. He found that a particular type of X-ray bolt that could be modified um, would wipe out cancer. You just turn it off for a little while. You can't leave a person in front of it because the toxins would kill him. But if you just gave him a short dosage, and then he figured out, well, shoot, they place these throughout the town. They had an eight-mile range then you would be able to um, inoculate everybody from cancer. So he was arrested and they confiscated his equipment. Um, there was another guy, uh, his name escapes me. What he did was he looked through a pipe and he was looking at water. And when he looked at water, the water, the little ripples started going backwards. And anyway, he, he messed around with uh, these particular pipe tubing that he uh, started putting large cables on, attaching to ground and trying to get... Um, the energy is called organ, organ energy, kind of like an orgasm type, before we got the word, because it's life energy. But he, organ, it's called organ, he was able to make it rain. And the very last time he made it rain, there was a town asking in the United States for someone to please help if they could, that they were in a terrible drought. So he gets out there, sets up his equipment. Within 24 hours, it's just raining cats and dogs. And these men in suits show up, 
drag him off to prison and confiscate his equipment. So these, these inventors, they had so many amazing things, but people within the government, organizations that, um, you know, have their own self-interest that just don't want these things out. And there's so many books out there. I don't even, I'm not even going to waste my time writing books about it because they're already out there. If people just start looking. Um, and so the, the book actually describes a civilization, of people that are broken away and are using these technologies and they're using them to find the treasure from the Spanish galleon ships of which um, it's amazing how much treasure is out there. 1400 ships were lost out of the 1400, only 100 have been found mainly because they had iron cannon on them. The, the other ones had bronze cannon and there was uh, ships being sent to, to the, to Manila from Acapulco. They would go all the way to China, the Philippines. They'd load up with gold chains, porcelain, jade, uh, jewelry, and then they'd come back. It would take them one year to make the entire trip. Each of these ships, at the time they went down, had a billion dollars in treasure on them. One of them was lost off Oregon. One was lost off Canada. Several, they had no records of where they were. All the records of those have been burned, but that's why I like remote viewing because you can go see where they are. But, um, anyway, there were devices that I had help create that I can locate some of these cannon in the water. And anyway, I had hoped uh, to someday be able to treasure hunt and just, uh, you know, finance myself and get away. And so none of that happened. So I thought, well, I'll use that as uh, the plot in my book, how this guy gets his money, how he finances himself. And in order to treasure hunt, you have to have a tremendous amount of resources in libraries, in the um, maritime charts, the the records of um, magazines and newspapers, whatever was the time they wrote about it. And when you find it on paper and you can locate it on paper, then you can find it on land. You'll know exactly where it's at. Those are the most successful treasure hunters. So this guy in the story trying to locate a ship, the Maravilla, the Nuestra Señora de Maravilla, that ship had 280 tons of silver on board because of the ballast, the ballast rock rocks that they used for the ship to keep it stable. They took the ballast rocks out and, and loaded it with silver chunks of silver and um, or actually ingots of silver which looked like like loaves of bread it had a statue of Mary and Jesus life size 1600 pounds of gold and it had a, um, a gold table 3,000 pounds when crushed it with emeralds so anyway in my story this that's the ship they're after and they're caught in a storm because they're in a, aboard a special submersible in the Bermuda Triangle and that sends him back to the time of Christ and when you when you're in a meditative state like that, time goes. It's it's different for the people that are out here. You can experience far more time in there. So he basically uh, is back at the time of Christ, and he's in a position to to avert the crucifixion. And he tries everything under his power to not get Christ crucified or or help him. And yet it happens anyway. But it doesn't happen the way we've 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 seen it, the way it's been read to us. It happens quite differently. And Christ is guilty. He's not innocent the way we've been told he's been innocent. Um, that took me a long time to prove. But he was guilty. And the Christians who were all fed to the lions back then, when Rome was hunting down Christians, the crime they were being hunted down for was uh, atheists. And they were accused of being atheists. They were given a chance to redeem themselves and change, but they wouldn't. And the reason they were atheists was because they did not believe the emperor was God. In our mind, that's crazy. But uh, I think that today, let's say Christ returned and he was here, he would not be allowed to speak before Congress because of the separation of church and state. But if Congress were to vote the president to be a god and you had to worship him, that doesn't break any laws. They could enforce that. So it's really crazy what the, the world's become. At any rate, he was, he was guilty and that changes everything. It, it alters why they were doing it. It explains the motives of why the priests were acting the way they were acting to preserve themselves. And the other thing that it does is it shows the mastery that Christ had in every situation. He brought that about. He made it happen. And on a particular date, he made it happen. The sun, the moon, and the earth were in perfect alignment to be able to move the moon out of position, hold it over Jerusalem for three and a half hours, then move it back, creating a second eclipse with Within hours of each other and cause the least amount of damage on the planet. And um, that that tied them in with the Anunnaki. I knew nothing about the Anunnaki. I knew the moon was artificial. I didn't know how it got there. I didn't know who put it there. Um, 
the research I did with David Icke, he believes the reptilians put it there, and he's right, the reptilians did bring it, but the reptilians um, are not in control of it anymore. The, the moon has tremendous amount of damage all over it. There are, there's wreckage, there's ships, there's uh, some really massive ships on board the moon. If you start looking for it, just Google um, structures on the moon. And a lot of the photographs are from NASA. NASA ordered this particular individual to destroy all the, the last videos. There were three different copies of the videos. And he didn't destroy them. He started uh, giving them to museums. And NASA got very upset about that because they hadn't quite wiped out everything that's on them. That base that's on the dark side that looks like a swastika, that is a, a Nazi base. The, the Nazis that are there now, they're no longer um, of the same mindset that their grandparents were but they do have the technology and that base has been added to quite a bit. What was very disturbing was the uh, paper, paper clip project that they had here in the United States where they brought 1,500 uh, Nazi war criminals over and then placed them within corporations. You have to understand, um, Russia did the same, only they didn't put them in very high uh, positions. I don't know what, your, um, what England did with them. I know they took a third, but the US placed them in companies like um, Raytheon and 3M and uh, Boeing, McDonnell Douglas. These individuals, if nobody knew they were Nazi uh, criminals and had new identities, were very intelligent and they'd have been able to rise within the company. They did it in the pharmaceutical industry, they did it in the medical industry. So if you understand that these individuals were embedded into the industry, into the system, they were in the most classified projects that we have. Um, it wouldn't be difficult to understand how they were able to communicate with each other, combine their plot together, sort of, and eventually just undo the United States and take it over, which is pretty much what they've done. Yeah, and that's why they act the way they act, because they were these incredible evil people. Yes. Or, you know, people that had an agenda and would do anything to, to make it happen. Exactly. They just, they knew, that's the problem with democracy is you can infiltrate it, you know, <laughs> it's the, the idea of having free choice and things like that. And when you have the big corporations, you know, put the politicians in their pocket, it's all downhill from there. They're just working in the corporation's interest and not the people. And then they can compartmentalize everything, you know, with the government, this, that, and the other. And just like you said, it's a control system. And agencies, um, are actually writing laws. Agencies aren't supposed to be able to write laws. That agency that's taking over land, the one where they shot that one guy when he took over his land. If you look at how much land they've taken over, it's a tremendous amount of land. And this agency does not answer to Congress. They don't answer to anyone. So that's how they were able to, to uh, get so much done, create these agencies and give them incredible amounts of power and leeway. And they actually write their own laws without Congress having anything to do with it. So I, I look forward to the day when they actually do I guess, I don't know what other word to use other than full disclosure. By full disclosure, we're not talking about just the UFOs in the sky. They're going to um, basically show the public what these individuals have done, all their war crimes. Not just war crimes, but crimes against humanity that they're doing now. And um, that hopefully will wake up the public. But Nasara, do you know what Nasara is? Nasara's law. The, yeah. yeah, I know. The act, yeah. There's a lot of talk about that going through. I, I hope they get it pushed through. If they don't, I, I really don't see any any future for the U.S. because it, it really won't be there. We'll actually be we pulled into whatever they call the uh, New World Order or whatever. And I do go into that a lot in the book, the New World Order. That's why they're so stealthy, the equipment they use. There's um, something I learned about documents that were authentic to the Illuminati. If you, let's say you have a... a document from the Catholic Church and is ordering certain things to take place, which doesn't look right. The last period on the page, take a magnifying glass or uh, take a microscope, that period is actually has the, the all-seeing eye, the triangle with the all-seeing eye over it. Oh, That's how you knew it was authentic. It won't come out on a copier. That's pretty you know? cool. Yeah, so they're, they're everywhere. They really are, and they're very patient individuals. They have a lot of money. And they look for individuals like um, Clinton. Clinton received, there, there's grants they give to these people who um, really show promise and have almost no scruples. 
So they get, they just basically get a red carpet to whatever college they want to go through. And they're, they're given all the money they would need to be spending and everything's paid for them so that they can um, basically put them in positions where they could be more useful later on, whether it's military or politics. And of course the professors, there are professors there that their job is just to find these individuals. And um, that's what they do. They look for them. So our country's become this. I kind of wish it hadn't. It's, it's really a great nation and that a person would have any rights whatsoever. Uh, we don't understand that because we didn't live in, that, in those days, but the king could kill anyone they wanted to, uh, run over them with a wagon or whatever. It wasn't murder. It was, especially it was the king. It just, and they said whatever they wanted to, and it became law. Um, it, it was not a good time to be alive as, as a human. You just, you weren't even considered cattle. You were, you were lower than that. And here, that a human has any rights whatsoever. Um, in the movies, they like to say, oh, you, we're going to suspend your Fifth Amendment. You have no rights. Well, the Fifth Amendment, or any, any rights, Bill of Rights, it does not give you rights. It doesn't give you rights, doesn't give me any rights. It says the government does not have the right to impose itself on you or take any, take your freedom away because the government never gave it to you. It didn't give you these inalienable rights. And from the outset, basically states, creator gave you these inalienable rights and the government cannot take them from you. And um, anyway, I hope, uh, I hope they do get to put all this back together. My book pushes that a lot. Um, not like pushing it. I just try and make people aware of it, that it is there and guide them to websites or uh, books that they can start looking at to, to really see that this is there and how they can, I don't know, prepare for when they finally start trying to move on it. Because that's how they're going to get you. I've heard um, when you're catching wild pigs that you would uh, feed them and they'll keep coming out to where you're at. Then you'll put up a fence on one side and, um, They'll kind of be weary of that, but eventually they'll come and get some whatever you're putting out there. And then you put another fence connected to that, and they'll be weary of that. And eventually you keep on going until you finally got the gate up there, and they go in there, they just close the gate. And we are more, more than happy to put a gate along our southern border. Um, here in Texas, there are so many illegal aliens working, and I wish they would arrest the individuals who hire them they actually started enforcing the laws that are already on the books. People would stop doing that because it, it does take the jobs away from the Masons who are trying to put up the bricks. These guys do it a lot faster for a lot less money. Uh, the carpenters who, you know, the framers, um, just pretty much any industry, the driving, uh, the driving is horrible. They don't speak English and they, you know. but uh, I mean, I don't have anything against them. They're trying to do themselves better, but if they would just, Enforce the laws that are already in the books. You don't have to make any laws. You don't have to make a wall. Just start arresting the uh, people that are hiring them, making all this money. The ones making by not exactly. exactly not not don't punish the the worker as much. I mean, I mean that's obvious. You can go, you know, there's ways around that. But punish the guy that's hiring them, capitalizing off the cheap work and the labor. You know what I mean? That's the idea. Because then they wouldn't hire them because they're looking out for themselves. Period. You know. Not to cut you short, Joe, but we got to get, I got a couple things to do this evening. I'll work in the morning and uh, I'd like to have you back on the show weekly if we can, maybe bi-weekly and maybe okay. we can. Try and think of a topic, something you want questions asked because I've, I've read a tremendous amount of books and um, if you give it to me in advance and I don't have that much information, I can actually research it yeah. quite fast. I seem to be able to just, if I ask for the information, it'll show up or I'll be guided to it and then we could all learn it up the things that we would like to know for what's about to happen yeah definitely uh we'll just keep that in mind guys everybody that's watching uh ask questions pay attention and i'll uh pay attention to the comments there and i'll i'll feed them some info for next time and it's been great having you on i'll have your links for your books in the description and we'll go from there uh, okay also um you asked me where it was available it's on barnes and noble Apple, something called Kobe, Page Foundry, and uh, Amazon. And you can actually get the actual book from Amazon through Lightning Source and Page Foundry, an actual book you hold in your hand. I like to have books because I like to write all over them and highlight. Me too. Put notes.
I'd prefer to have especially ebooks. I'd prefer to have even a paperback. You know, it's hard to get a hardback anymore, but uh, <laughs> I prefer paper. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's it's been nice talking to you, man. Uh, glad that we finally got to catch up, and I'll just keep in touch, and I'll see you soon there. All right. Thanks a lot. You have a good one, man.